recording. All right, so <clears throat> we'll uh, recap from last week. Again, everything that I'm saying is coming out of this. Um, it was a parenting class that was part of a, a family at the church that we went to in Little Rock. They had a ministry where they would, it was like a DVD series, kind of like Faith Bible Institute. You'd watch a lecture type thing, fill in some blanks in the book, and then it has just a ton of resources and stuff and things to think about uh, concerning parenting. And so since we were talking about uh, discipline and growth through discipline, they have really good distinctions, ways to frame the whole discussion that I find very helpful. So I'm bringing that to you. Um, really, really great stuff. I highly recommend. But last week we talked about uh, discipline through encouragement. A lot of times when we think of discipline, we don't think of encouragement as a form of discipline. But usually what we're doing is we're narrowing the definition of discipline to punishment. And that's not the biblical definition. Discipline is more of training and teaching in a way that a person should go. That will include positive and negative uh, reinforcement. Usually we think of the negative reinforcement, which is what we're going to talk about today. But we talked about discipline with encouragement last week. So we're teaching moral principles to our children for their use later in life. We're planting in their hearts moral principles. And those principles, they'll be able to like go through the filing cabinet and pull it out later when they encounter a new situation and they're not sure what to do. If they have those principles in there, they'll have something to rely upon and pull from. If they don't have those principles in there, they're just going to do whatever their heart leads them to do. And that can be dangerous. So we're teaching moral principles. And so we do that by giving the moral or practical reason why they should or shouldn't do something. Um, and it's just teaching the right thing to do. There are non, we talked about non-moral life skills and moral behavior. Um, yeah, non-moral life skills and moral behavior. Those are the two kind of different areas in life that we talked about uh, providing encouragement. Non-moral life skills, uh, I just used rock climbing as because I coach rock climbing all the time. But that's non-moral. It's a skill that you can develop, and there are better ways to do those things. So as your coach, I would tell you to lean, you know, don't pull in all the time. Send your arm. Use your back muscles instead of your bicep and lean on the side pull so that way you don't tire out smaller muscles. You use larger muscle groups to get up the wall. Tell you how to do it. You practice it. Praise. It's like, great job. You did really well. And if you surprise children with praise for they do something right and then they don't know that you're watching and then you go, oh, that was awesome. Really great job. High five. That communicates a lot to children. It's an encouragement, right? They're like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm making mommy or daddy proud of me or happy with me. Awesome. Praise, praise, praise. Uh, if they're learning a tough skill and they're getting discouraged, you can incentivize them with a goal. Uh, the example in, in the book is uh, they had a daughter that was learning how to swim, and they said, hey, we'll buy you a, a mask and a snorkel if you can swim out to that buoy and back by the end of the summer. I want that mask. So she just practiced, 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 and then when she was able to swim there and back, she got the mask and snorkel, and it incentivized her to work harder, right, and not be discouraged, continue through what is sometimes a painful process of learning new skills, goal incentives really strong encouragement. But then there's also moral behavior. Um, and there's pre-activity encouragement and post-activity encouragement. So with the pre-activity encouragement, we're talking about setting up a child for success. And so it's like, all right, we're about to enter into a situation where your moral behavior becomes paramount or it's important. I want, I'm going to remind you of what, what the rule is or what the expectations are before you get there going to get a reminder and it's on their head and then when they do it <clears throat> more praise more encouragement it's like great job exactly what i wanted you to do awesome it's like we're walking through the parking lot what are the rules and this is another another method dialogue question what are the rules for the parking lot 
got to hold mommy's hand. Got to be, you know, don't go out on the road, no running. They list out the rules like, awesome, great job. Praise, praise, praise. Build that up. And then there's speaking in the positive. So I use my rescue scenario at the gym as an example. Like if someone's 30 feet on the wall, they're not attached to anything. If they fall, they're probably going to get hurt or die. I'm going to go rescue them. I'm going to say, hey, stop climbing. Keep hanging on. Instead of don't let go. Because in order to negate the sentence, you have to think about letting go in order to not let go. I don't want you thinking about letting go. I want you to just keep hanging on. Grip harder. <laughs> like, do, do this thing, not don't do that thing. Speaking in the positive. Post-activity encouragement. This is reinforcing a completed behavior. So they do something. Let's say your uh, classic example, going through, you're getting food at Walmart or, I don't know, Fred Meyer, wherever you go. And you're shopping. Your kid's doing really Kind of surprising. All right. Not, not bad. You know, they're not just like pulling stuff off the shelves and asking for everything that's within their eyesight and, you know, not running away and trying to get to the toys, but actually staying with you. Everything's going pretty well. Sweet. Let's give them a treat. Let's reward that behavior. So you give, you give the reward. You reinforce the behavior after it's already done. If you do it before, then you're just bribing them, and then they're not actually doing the right thing. That's just the right. They're just like, oh, sweet. I'm going to get a reward. That's why I'll do the right thing. Not what we, that's not the moral kind of character we want our children to have. So reinforce the completed behavior afterward. We use affirmation and uh, rewards. So again, more words of encouragement, affirmation of what they've already done. And use encouragement to teach and to guide behavior. And then eventually those moral principles will be in their heart. And later in life, they'll be able to use those in other situations. That's all encouragement. But it's not always encouragement. A lot of times there's a lot of correction, especially for the little ones. The smaller they are, there's usually a lot of discipline with correction. And I mean, not to say that as they get older, it's just like, oh, great, it's sunshine and rainbows. It's, it just gets easier. It gets more sophisticated, for sure, because they're Manipulation can get more sophisticated because <clears throat> they're thinking about how they can get away with things. But correction. What are we talking about with correction? So most parents think of correction when they think about discipline, but the biblical but biblical discipline is the process of training and learning that fosters moral development. Correction is only one part of that moral training or that discipline process. And that discipline is most effective in the context of a healthy parent-child relationship. Sometimes we get it into our heads, it's like, oh, if I could just find the right punishment, then it would fix this problem. Like, that's the wrong kind of thinking. Like, your goal is to help them learn something. Not to, I need to fix this problem so they, keep, they don't keep bothering me. That's a very self-oriented view of parenting. You know, your view is other oriented. And so it's like I'm working towards the betterment of my child. The goal of correction is learning and understanding. That's what it is. The act of bringing back from error or unacceptable deviation from the standard. So learning is the goal. Learning and understanding. Therefore, correction always requires explanation. You're just executing some kind of punishment and there's no explanation at all, that's not correction. They have to know why the correction is taking place. Otherwise, it becomes a redirection of behavior and not correction. Correction should lead the child from what she, he or she did to what he or she should do next time. That's the idea. And there's many, uh, many transitions uh, that that come and this I just pulled out of the book so <clears throat> this is over the course of you know of their life as they're in your household but should be gaining more understanding and producing uh, improved patterns of conduct so a maturing process and so you're moving from kind of one thing to another and they contrast a, a few different things first 
nature versus will. So at first, a child does wrong as a result of his or her nature, right? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It's just out of their, their human nature, out of their sin nature, they do wrong, sinful things. But as a child gets older, the child will choose to do wrong with the understanding of why it's wrong and still choose it. There's a difference there. There's a maturation. So nature versus will. And as they get older, it should be kind of moving towards that thing. And so we want them to will do the right thing. We have to deal with their nature, but we want them to will to do the right thing. There's training versus education. So training, uh, that's the how of behavior. So what does the right response look like? And when they're little, it's almost like you have to, like, okay, here's what I want you to do. We're going to walk through the steps. Like, you did this. You wronged your sibling. I want you to go over there, look them in the eye, say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now, if they're like, you know, if they're very young, they're not going to understand ex all of that exactly. But you're putting the pattern in place for later when they do understand it. It's like, that's training, right? What the right response looks like. <clears throat> but then the education is the why behind the behavior, the understanding why it is the right response, and then you're going to internalize that. And there's a maturation process between those two. Boundaries versus freedom. The boundaries are external limitations, whereas freedom is an internal self-restraint. That's what we want to work towards. Compliance versus obedience. Compliance is following directions because an authority said so, but obedience is choosing to yield because of, of an appreciation for the virtue of obedience, or because of the trust that you have within that parental child relationship. But it's a choice. Obedience is a choice. There's the external versus the internal. So there's outward pressure to conform a child or the internalized principles that motivate, motivate the right behavior. And then authority versus influence. So parents at first lead by authority. And then as, they, as children get older, they lead by their influence. Ages one to about three and a half, almost entirely working on outward behavior until about three, three and a half years old. Doing the wrong behavior, but do not have the understanding of the moral implications behind that behavior or how it's affecting all the other relationships that they have around. Correction of behavior by demonstrations of the right behavior, right? So you demonstrate it. And then it needs to be corrected, uh, but does not have, the child does not have the capacity to understand the moral reason why. That's like one to three and a half, roughly. And these are all like very rough. Every child is going to be a unique you know, individual. it's going to be different. Ages three to three and a half to five. Many times you're still working on outward behavior, but you begin giving the moral reason why. So you're implanting those principles into their heart. You're shifting away from because I said so to why I said so. And there's still, there's still chastisement or, you know, corporal punishment or some kind of, you know, and that takes place mostly within that, like, Younger, all the way up to about like five. Most of that should be done by five. But we're going to say chastisement is moving more towards natural consequences to train and personal responsibility. And then more and more explaining, planting moral principles in the heart, and allowing more freedom and responsibility with things and objects. In like nine to 14, you're still internalizing more moral principles. There's more explaining, more educating. But the influence of friends becomes very strong. So there's going to be sometimes a clash with that. And children start to question whether their parents' values are actually their values. And then there's clash with that. There's, a little, there's less corporal punishment or chastisement and more loss of privileges, natural consequences, restitution, doing wrong. And then from like teenagers on into adulthood, <clears throat> parents are leading by influence, more freedom and responsibility, and consequences are based on the loss of trust. The loss of freedom when responsibility is not practiced, and there's very little, if any, chastisement, like spanking. The correction, at the learning and understanding is the goal. You bring them back from error or the unexpected deviation from the standard, trying to learn. Punishment is 
under that. Punishment. It's a fitting retribution of an offense. It's a type of correction. It's not the only type, but it is a type. Punishment communicates a statement of value. Take a moment to think about that. Punishment communicates a statement of value. The degree and seriousness of a wrongful act is determined by the punishment. A child's sense of justice is established by punishment, not rewards. Not only that, punishment is only a punishment when it's executed by the proper authority. Otherwise, it becomes aggression or revenge, but not punishment. So, an example. Let's say you have one child, and they grab their plastic bat, and they, they hit their sibling with it. It causes bruising. It was like, it's a serious whack. Like, pretty bad, right? And then you give them a punishment of five minutes time out. What did you just communicate to the child? Hurting others is not a big deal. All it amounts to is sitting in a chair for five minutes. Like, that's what punishment does. It communicates a statement of value. What you did was wrong, and there's going to be a just recompense for that. Punishment needs to fit the crime. So if you over or under punish, that's very dangerous. Because again, you're communicating the statement of value. So it's like, you left your light on. You can't hang out with your friends for a week. Whoa. <laughs> like, where did that come from? Like, we take electricity very seriously in my house. Yes, you do. Oh my gosh. Wow. Like, that's way overdoing it, right? And that's an extreme example, just funny. But... But if you over or under punish, it's, it communicates the wrong thing. It communicates the wrong thing. Uh, there, there are different types of punishment, right? There's a loss of... Sorry, should I? Um, there's loss of an object or a privilege. There's isolation. And chastisement. So that's physical pain. So there's, there's different types of punishment, and it's your job to decide which one will communicate the proper value to the thing that was done wrong. But learning is the goal. Again, I'm going to say that. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. Learning is the goal. There's two questions you can, you can ask yourself when determining what kind of punishment should be administered. The first, the type of correction depends on the presence or absence of evil motive. Was it an intentional moral violation that affects other people? If yes, that deserves punishment. That deserves punishment. Was it an accident or was it malicious? So, the kid that has the bat and hits sister, were they playing a game? And he, you know, he tries to, to hit the ball, but she went to go grab the ball and got whacked. Was not intentional. He wasn't just like, I'm going to wait around the corner. She comes around, whack. I want to inflict pain on her or him, whoever. That's the intention. That needs to be punished. You need to communicate that's unacceptable and place a value on it <clears throat> by the kind of punishment you give out. So you can ask yourself, was this an accident or was it malicious? Where's the hard attitude behind this? Second question you can ask. What punishment would fit the wrong or convey the right value message? So because punishment sets a value on behavior, determining the seriousness of the wrongful act, and it instills in the child a sense of justice, you need to be mindful of the kind of punishment that you give relative to the act that was committed. So concerning this, this first question, the Ezos have... A distinction. There's foolishness and childishness. Foolishness and childishness. Now, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, right? That means rebellion. That's what it means. The foolish person disregards God, is rebellious against his law, does not care. That's a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. I will not be held accountable. I'll do what I want. That's a fool. 
that's bound up in the heart of a child. Childishness is, is the, they just don't have much experience in the world. And they do things that are kind of dumb. It's like, well, now you're going to learn not to do that anymore. But there wasn't a malicious intent behind it. That's the difference between foolishness and childishness. So foolishness. Oh, whoops. One. Foolishness. Willful, intentional defiance and open rebellion. That's foolishness. Childishness. Accidents, unwise decisions, honest mistakes with no ill will. So there's a, dis a difference there. So there's a difference between accidentally hurting a sibling while playing and hurting a sibling with the intention of inflicting pain. There's a difference between a child accidentally damaging property and intentional vandalism. Spilling a drink in a car and dumping a drink on someone's head. There's a difference there. And we should be mindful of that. So when it comes to childishness, <clears throat> That, all, that needs correcting, right? What are the ways that we can correct childishness? So you've already determined that a, there was no ill intent, no ill will towards whatever, you know, whatever the child did. Admonishment is the first step. So there's a warning. Talk to them, right? Warn the child that the action or lack of action is unwise and that later in life it'll bring calamity on him or herself or others. Like, hey, you shouldn't do that because there's just bad consequences for that. Don't do that. It's a warning. Like how you talk to your sister, tone that you take, she's not going to want to be your friend later in life if you continue talking to her like that, if you treat her like that. Don't do that. It's a warning. It, it'll ruin your relationship, then you won't have a sister. Like, don't ruin that relationship. A warning, right? <clears throat> Related consequences. This has to do with like property and privilege and personal responsibility. So <clears throat> usually mistakes that are made that are childish occur in one of these three areas, roughly. So if you fail to be a good steward with a, some property that you have, you don't take care of, you don't clean up your toys, right? Or you don't make your bed or... Uh, let's say a kid has a bike <clears throat> and the rule is you have to put your bike away when you're done using it. And, you know, I just got really distracted because someone came over to the house. They just ditched the bike in the yard, came inside, left it out all night. Like, all right. Didn't intend to do that, but there was something special going on. So it just went outside of the kid's mind. Childish mistake. But someone could steal the bike. You leave it outside repeatedly, it's going to rust and wear out. Like, you need to take care of your property. You need to teach that, right? It's like, cool. Maybe the first time they get an admonishment. <clears throat> it's like, hey, you need to take care of your bike. Make sure you put it away or whatever it is. Now they've gotten the warning. And if it happens again, it's like, looks like you can't be responsible with your bike. I'm taking your bike away for a certain amount of time. And that's more painful because now they don't have their bike and now they have to deal with life without their bike. And they'll get it back at the appointed time. Uh, same thing, like if you provide a car for your teenager and they stay out later than they were supposed to. Like, I can't trust you with the car. I get the keys for however long. Right? You're not taking, or you get into the car and it's just like trash. It's like, well, when you, when you clean this up, then you'll, you'll be able to drive it again. I provided it for you. Privilege. So it's a freedom that requires responsibility. And then personal responsibility is a kind of, kind of a restitution idea where it's like you make up for childish mistakes. So there are consequences for making mistakes. Even though it wasn't like I wanted to hurt somebody or I wanted to take advantage of somebody, it's like, let's say you were playing in the living room and your foot gets caught on the wire and it pulls a lamp down and the lamp breaks. Like, well, that was childish. You should have been more mindful of where you were playing. The lamp's still broken. It still needs to be replaced. But it wasn't like ill intent. Well, now it's your responsibility to do chores to earn money to pay for the lamp. Like, 
that's a related consequence to childish behavior. Like, think of, of those things. Then there's foolishness. Disobedience is not childishness. It's rebellion, and rebellion is foolishness. There are many, many different kinds of rebellion, but they fall into these two categories, direct and indirect. I know it's small because there's lots of examples, but <clears throat> direct rebellion, just flat out disobeying, talking back, refusing to accept correction, rejecting parental authority. It's just like, in your face, I'm not listening to you. It's direct rebellion. That deserves punishment. There's also indirect types of rebellion. A haughty look, pretending not to hear. <laughs> I know you can hear me. I've got a loud voice. Hmm. Leading ignorance to the obvious after being caught in a misdeed. I, I didn't know. Hmm. Doing something good or cute to get out of following instructions. Man, children are the cutest little sinners we know. They're trying to manipulate the situation to not follow instructions. Like, no, no, no. This is what I told you to do. Like, I told you to, like, it's getting late. You need to go to the bathroom, brush your teeth, get ready for bed. And Emma wanders over to the cat. Starts petting the cat and is being all cute. Like, you're not following instructions. As cute as you are, not following instructions. It's indirect, but it's still not following instructions. Right? Saying, I forgot. Great. You're going to go to your room and do nothing until you remember. Like, you seem to remember all the fun things that you like to do, but you forgot about the thing that I wanted you to do. Like, there needs to be something. There needs to be a consequence for that. Sulking, pouting, whining, all indirect forms of rebellion. Those are, need to be corrected. Those need some form of punishment. Now, is it like, we're going to spank every time, you know, there's pouting? It's like, no. Because there's more than just chastisement in the repertoire of punishment. Loss of privilege, loss of an item. Like, yeah, we'll get to an example. There are a few things you need to consider uh, when correcting foolishness. So the frequency of the offense. Is it the first time? And they're usually pretty good about doing whatever it is you're instructing them to do. It's the first time. And it's like, okay, there needs to be correction, but it doesn't need to be, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's probably just a verbal thing. But there definitely needs to be a correction. If it's the fourth time today, then maybe the correction needs to be a bit more painful to send the right message. The age of the child. If they're like three, they're, they're still, I mean, learning a lot, but it's still like managing behavior and then trying to teach them the right way they should do things. Like there's a difference between a three-year-old and a 12-year-old. Like the level of understanding is, uh, I imagine you, you agree. <laughs> like working with elementary, like there's, like there's a difference between like the younger grades and, and as they get older, for sure. So consider that, um, especially if you have multiple children in the house and how you're executing judgment is observed by the other kids in the house. Like if they, if it seems like you're being partial to the other children, like yes and no, like the age of the child will help you determine what kind of punishment should be administered. But if it's grossly different from, let's say, you know, the eldest child's probably going to accuse parents of being soft on the younger child, right? Like that's the, <laughs> that's the typical, right? And it's like, okay. I mean, that's either, that's either yes or no, but there are factors to consider. <clears throat> Context of the moment, are you in public? 
Like chastisement's not appropriate in public. Don't do it in public. That's a private matter. So, something to consider. Even though you may feel like it needs to be nipped in the bud right now. No, that's inappropriate. <clears throat> and then the overall characterization of the behavior. So, level one, foolishness. It's a minor foolish infraction, really a verbal correction for the first time of a non-repeated foolish action. Verbal. Like, hey, this is not good. You need to change. Like, don't let this become a pattern. This is, how, this is basically how I deal with uh, employees at work. <laughs> like, hey, I was looking through timesheets, and I was like, looking through timesheets and you clocked in like 20 minutes late. Is there any context to why you were late? Sometimes there is. It's like, yeah, my car died. I needed to find someone to jump my battery and then I got to work. I called. Marianne said it was cool. I was like, great. I didn't, you know, all I saw was you were 20 minutes late. There's a good story behind it and it's believable. Then, great, cool. You know, don't let it become, yeah, don't let it become a pattern. But when you're another employee and you call out sick on really nice weekends, and right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that gets a chuckle, right? And then you tell me you couldn't make it into work because you're in a car accident, but it wasn't your car. It was someone else's car that you were borrowing, so you don't have an insurance claim on it. And you send me a picture that looks like it wasn't on the road. It was like something someone's back. It's like, hmm. Things are not fitting together in my head. Please help me understand. But that's like way down the road. Uh, minor foolish infractions. It's, it's a first time offense, like verbal correction, totally appropriate. But it is a correction of foolish behavior. Level two, this is when it starts to become repeated. Right? Repeated foolish infraction. You need some kind of action to go with the verbal admonishment. And it's a pattern of repeated, unacceptable behavior. This could be repeated daily foolish behavior, and it's going beyond level one. <clears throat> this is for new, unacceptable behavior that's becoming a pattern, old, bad habits re-emerging, uh, and a warning from yesterday that's not being heeded today. We're in level two. Could be a reflective timeout to ponder the previous correction and letting the child decide if they want to continue down that road. This is, a, this is slightly different than a timeout. So timeout is we have, like, our family is a community. Say the church is a community. And we're going to isolate you from social intera interaction as a punishment for how you're treating the people in society, in our family, in the church, whatever. The isolation is the punishment because we are social creatures. We want to be around each other. <clears throat> so we're going to isolate you. That's, that's a different kind of punishment. This reflective timeout is, whoa, 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 maybe your emotions are getting out of control. Maybe uh, you're not thinking about what's going on. We're just going to pause the situation. We're going to go and reflect on what's going on. And then we're going to talk about it. It's slightly different. <clears throat> and then SWATs would be appropriate in this level. Here's an example. Refusing to eat a meal. Never happens in your house, right? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, like, first, you have to explain, it's like, hey, you need to eat your, you got to eat your green beans. Fill in the blank with whatever the food is that your child's going to. Like, look, this behavior is unacceptable. Why is it unacceptable? Because mommy's worked hard to provide a healthy meal for you. Your response should be gratitude and eating the food. That's what the response should be. Now you've, all right, value, you're valuing your mom's hard work and your response is eating the food, being grateful. You're being disrespectful towards your mother when you refuse to eat what she's provided. It doesn't have to be your favorite food. You don't have to get seconds, but you do have to eat it. Because she's provided it for you. And it's good for you. It's not going to kill you. This is not poison. Eat your green beans. Eat your fill in the blank. Whatever it is. 
What you're choosing to do is rude and disrespectful. You need to stop what you're doing. Change your behavior. Teaching, 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 right? Giving the moral reason why. Thinking about other people besides how I hate eating green beans, right? That's all in there. <clears throat> and then it's like, so then what we do is like, all right, you're not eating your green beans. We're going to set a timer for 30 seconds. And you need to eat that green bean in the 30 seconds or there's going to be some kind of consequence. How stubborn are you going to be? Anytime the timer comes out, like, great, you no longer get dessert. That's the first, like, well, we got to pull out the timer. Now there's no dessert. That's a consequence, right? You're withholding a privilege that is good and that the child likes. And it's like, all right, now, now there's going to be a timer for every green bean, and you are going to eat your green beans. Like, they still refuse. Well, daddy doesn't like throwing away food. That's unacceptable to me. You're going to eat this food for breakfast. That's the next, right? It's like, you're going to eat this food. How stubborn are you going to be? And it's like, still refuses, still refuses. Okay, sounds like you need some pain to change your mind. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the what? The house of pain, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, this is like, now we've gone into like, really, like this kind of step-by-step -step thing that I just described. Really, we're in, like, this is level three where it's just offenses that require the full weight of parental law, right? Routine attitudes of defiance and acts of defiance, both active and passive, and their moral violations against others. Like, unacceptable. There needs to be something that corrects that behavior. And so you use discomfort to get the child's attention. Pain can come by many means, could be natural or logical consequences, loss of privileges, restitution, or chastisement. So we're going to talk about natural and structured consequences, and then next week we'll talk about uh, chastisement, spanking. But nothing gets a person's attention faster than pain. It's very quick. It warns us that some, and pain is not a bad thing. It's not like a result of the fall. Pain is a good thing. God created the world with pain, us to have pain receptors. Because, you know, standing next to a fire, it's like, I'm this close. Oh, I can kind of feel the warmth. I take a step closer. Oh, that's really warm. That's nice. Ooh, get a little bit closer. Hmm, it's starting to get a little uncomfortable. Now I'm in the fire and I'm on fire. That's painful. Let me back away. Like, pain is a good thing. It tells you something's wrong. Like, people with, uh, you know, what, what the Bible describes as, uh, well, no, not what the Bible describes as leprosy, but people with leprosy, when they lose their feeling, when they lose their pain receptors and their fingers and their face and stuff, they'll like scratch their nose off because they can't feel that they're like literally doing damage to their body. Pain is a good thing. It communicates a lot and very quickly, warns us that something is wrong and needs attention. It helps a child focus and gain self-control over destructive behavior. Whether that's disobeying, talking back, or intentional discourtesy, pain is the method to get their attention. So there's natural and structured consequences. Natural consequences, right? Foolish behavior can bring its own pain. Like, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. Like, foolish behavior just brings its own pain. Sometimes you don't have to worry about it. It's like, hey, don't pull the cat's tail. And they pull the cat's tail, they get scratched. It's like, well, yeah, too bad for you. Told you not to. Shouldn't have done that, right? But if you, as, as the parent, go over and go, oh, no, no, and then, like, you hug the child, and you're like, oh, oh bad kitty. You just negated the consequence. Like, don't do that. Foolishness brings its own pain. Let the pain do the work. Lessons learned the hard way are not soon forgotten. There's also removing a privilege, right? Like, hey, you have so much time to clean up your toys out of the living room. Whatever's left out goes in the trash. They'll move quickly. 
if they care about their toys. Like, here's a natural consequence. I don't want these toys out here. If they remain out here, after this timer goes off, they go away, and then they're not where they don't need to be. Like, removing the privilege of having that toy. You can't take care of it, or take care of, yeah. I think you get the point. So, uh, sometimes uh, the girls will argue over Roblox. So, some of you guys heard of that computer game? Roblox all the time, right? Or <laughs> <laughs> gotta play roblox well they're playing a game and then they start picking at each other well, don't do that and, and they start getting angry it's like oh great looks like you guys can't play the game like now you, you don't get the privilege of playing the game anymore it's a natural consequence like you're doing something that's inappropriate with what you're doing so you take that thing away sometimes those consequences aren't natural, so you have to structure the consequence, and it needs to be logical with it. The foolish behavior does not always result in painful outcome, and when it doesn't, then you have to create a method of correction for the offense. Again, loss of privileges, isolation, especially if it has to do with uh, um, social contact and how they're treating others. If you're mistreating people around you, then hey, you're gonna go. Be by yourself, so that way you don't mistreat other people. You're teaching the child that he or she is responsible for controlling their behavior in social settings. So it's like, Emma can be overcome by her emotions and when she gets upset, like so much so that she can't speak. So at that point, it's like, hey, go to your room, calm down, and we can talk about this. And then those consequences need to be logically connected to the offense. The next week we'll talk about chastisement. But let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you that we get to come to your house. We get to worship you. We get to re be reminded of your goodness towards us, but also that you don't let us stay where we were. You help us to grow in maturity and in holiness through this sanctification process. Pray that your Holy Spirit would, would guide us in that process, that would bring up those sins that are in our lives, and Lord, help us to reflect on those, to repent, and believe the gospel again afresh. See that even that sin is nailed to the cross. Be grateful and try, try to live a holy life for you. Be that for you in this, in this world. Lord, help us to worship you. Help us to sing praises to your name. Lord, be with our hearts as we hear your word preached. May it plant those moral principles in our soul that we can use later.